Hello, welcome to this episode from Bedfordshire Lymphedema. Today, I am interviewing Emma Holly. Hello, Holly. Hello, Emma. Woo! <laughs> Emma Holly is the owner and uh, principal therapist at Restore Therapy Clinic in Harpenden, and she's also got a gig in Harley Street as well. So, Emma, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, thanks very much for organising this. Um, so my name's Emma Holly and um, my background is in massage therapy. That's how I got into working with scars. Um, I've been, I would consider myself to be described as a holistic therapist. So that means rather than anything um, to kind of alternative, it just means when I look at treating a person, I look at them in a holistic way. So not just separating out an injury or something that's happened to them, but look about how that's affecting everything from them um, physically in, in, in their entirety of their body or emotionally as well. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. I love what I do. Um, I work principally now with people recovering after surgeries or incidents that have left them with a scar and every client's different. I really love it. Oh, fantastic. And I also understand you train therapists to That's right. Yeah. what you do. I get uh, yeah, so I've, I've got two separate elements to my business. I've got um, the therapy clinic, um, which is, like, like Rachel said, in, in Harley Street and in Harpenden. Um, and then also I run training courses for qualified therapists who want to add in these skills to their existing practice. Um, and that was how we met, actually, because you came along. And, yes, that's correct. Uh, yes, which was really great. So I get a real range of, of therapists that I meet from people who work anyway with, um, you know, kind of post-operative complications like lymphedema, but also just um, sports massage therapists, physiotherapists. Um, you know, it's it's really diverse. So I, I love I love the two elements of my job. It's uh, it's really really exciting, and always changing. It's nice, to, it's nice to see such passion. And where, whereabouts are you in your skull work journey? What, 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 whereabouts well, I always think of myself as still being quite early on, but then I hear myself speaking sometimes and realise that I must know something. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> I wouldn't be teaching it. Um, I mean, the, the lovely thing is, is that when I came on to learn about um, scar work and, and scar tissue treatments, it really wasn't something that was being considered very much at all within the UK therapy scene. Um, and I just assumed that there was already lots and lots of specialists out there. And then it turned out that actually there weren't, but the time in which I started um, my journey, there was also quite a big change in the way that people were looking at how perhaps an adhesion or scar tissue might affect people in a bigger way that they'd thought before because I think we were always looking at the body in a very compartmentalized way and thinking that if you had an injury somewhere it was only going to cause a problem very local to that injury or if you had a you know dysfunctional area so the scar tissue might be tight and restricting right. movement and now what what people are realizing particularly with who work within therapy is that because of this tissue that they're learning more and more about called fascia which is one of the layers within our in our body or, or part of the components that make up our body actually it's so much more impactful if you've got a problem in one area it probably is affecting the whole to some degree or other so something that's going on in one part of your body could be causing a pain in the other part of your body um, and that made it really exciting to be just kind of starting off on, on this journey of working with um, scars when lots of people were starting to think, Oh, do you know what? I think I need to learn a bit about working with scars or that's something I want to explore. So it's, it's, uh, it's been quite fortuitous. I think the timing of, of my in engagement with it. And also I, I just put a lot of energy into doing as much research as I could and trying to find out as much information as I could to yeah. try and, establish my knowledge um and experience and how how i've really tried to put myself into situations to give myself as broad an experience as possible with people from all different kinds of walks of society who maybe it's because um you know they need to improve their sporting performance or maybe it's because they they just their daily life is getting impacted or maybe they're old or maybe they're young I've really tried to keep my practice as variety as full of variety as possible so that I can learn from all those different experiences mm. and keep an overview of all the different people who can be impacted in really really various ways 
Fantastic, because you, you, you do uh, a lot of charity work as well. You, you've done uh, work with uh, Invictus, haven't you? I Tell have. us a little bit about that. So um, the Invictus journey actually started with a different charity. I, um, there's a wonderful charity um, who, who, which was started off um, back when the Bosnian War um, was still happening or just as it was coming to an end. There were three ladies in the UK who wanted to go out and offer some therapy support to, to people in Sarajevo and who had been impacted by, by the, the Bosnian conflict. And um, even though that was more than 20 years ago now, obviously the people who lived through those horrific um, experiences that went on over there um, are still suffering, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't go through um, those kind of atrocities without um, being scarred for life. And so the charity is still ongoing and has a clinic out in Sarajevo and an outreach project to people who live more in the villages. Um, to send therapists to go and offer treatment. So I very first started to work with people who'd had those kind of very severe injuries and, and amputations and so on. Um, when I went out and volunteered with Healing Hands Network and it was through that that I realised um, the joy and the pleasure of being able to help people who've had very severe injuries. And it can, it's a therapist if it's the first time you're working with something you you like any other job if you're doing it for the first time you think am I going to be able to do this um, how am I going to feel about it emotionally because mm -hmm. when you're working with somebody who's had a lot of trauma you don't yet know if you've not experienced that before how how you will process it um but I I just found it to be really a wonderful and very positive experience and so I came back from um from spending a week in in Bosnia treating uh, the wonderful people out there and thought you know what I bet there are lots of people who've had very horrific injuries in the UK who could probably benefit from um, being able to access this kind of treatment which isn't really available and so I started hounding, hounding loads of thera uh, different charities. <laughs> I started um, with Blessma which is a limbless veteran charity um, who were very open-minded and managed to get a little bit of contact going with them and it was through um, what somebody who's gone on to become an incredible para-athlete called Luke Sinnott. Um, he um, experienced some scar work treatment and gave an introduction for, for us uh, in, to go and do some work with the Invictus athletes and so we've been doing that since 2017 so I organise a team of therapists to go out um, and be sort of on the track side or on the edge of the basketball court and to, to give these people uh, an opportunity to try a different therapy. Perhaps they've got a bit stuck with where they're at normally because that's why they're on the recovery journey with Invictus. It's, it's designed not to be necessarily sporting excellence. It's about mm -hmm. helping people recover when they've um, gone through something really tough and um, yeah, it's just amazing the the atmosphere and the banter and the uh, the the fun that you get and the camaraderie. Um, mm. Having never been involved in the army or anything uh, or any of the services myself, I, I wasn't aware. <laughs> I wasn't aware how much fun they had. And uh, yeah, it's it's great. It's great to be around. Stuff as a volunteer myself within a hospice that supported mainly people who had had cancer diagnosis and were in recovery. Um, so we started up a scar clinic for uh, people who who were still suffering. Um, and that was in St Albans, Rennie Grove, a lovely charity. And I, I volunteered there for three years. And then I found when I started teaching, I was just getting busier and busier. Um, and I was very loath to kind of give up um, the work that I'd been doing. But I managed to find a, a therapist who would, who would replace me so that they didn't lose the service. And I started um, volunteering training for people who worked at hospices so mm -hmm. I've worked with quite a number of charities giving them um, free training so that they can offer that service at their hospice um, breast cancer haven in London we've done the Christie charity up in Manchester which are affiliated with the Christie hospital they're based on site um, Mulberry Centre uh, there's there's quite a few um, some Marie Curie and um, Macmillan uh, physiotherapists have come along and had access to free therapy and it's I, I started thinking you know that whole um thing of you know give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day and I thought well I can only give so many hours of my own person giving therapy but if I get a therapist who's already working in that situation or volunteering in that in in a charity mm -hmm. and I give them a free training course then they can help continuously and so it's been really it's been really great and it's um it's helped many more people access the treatment that perhaps couldn't afford to or wouldn't have heard of it or just aren't the type of people to 
you know you get all sorts of people and some people spend endless hours trying to research different ways they can support their recovery and for other people that just isn't how they operate that isn't how they work and they wait to see what they're offered because they assume that the medical profession will yeah. know everything that is going to help their recovery but you tend to be very when you work in a in a or you're trained quite high up in a, in a medical um sense you tend to be a, a real expert within your field but you don't know about all the other you don't necessarily i'm not saying that that no no medical person does but there will be other things out there that you won't have heard of because treatments are, are being developed all the time that can complement conventional therapy and that's very much where i see um you know scar therapy it's a complement to encourage uh, rehabilitation right let's let's go back to you what's your fa favorite part of doing what you do i mean i take it you like training but what, what about the other elements as as well i think for me in in all aspects of the work that i'm doing it's about watching the the delight on somebody's face i mean i, I think most people tend to get into therapy because they want to help other people so i became a therapist to help other people and make them feel better and there's a great pleasure in that. I'm very selfish. I love making people feel better because it feels good to do. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's just such a lovely profession to work in. No matter what mood somebody comes in, generally speaking, they'll leave in a better mood. And sometimes it can be quite a huge transformation, even in a single treatment, whether that's an emotional transformation or physically, you can really shift things on for them. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people come to treatment with a bit of trepidation they perhaps don't know what to expect. They don't know if this is going to hurt. They don't know how it might make them feel, um, if they'll feel um, kind of exposed or intruded on. Because a, a scar of any nature is a very personal thing. And it, even if they might not realise it consciously, most scars will have an emotional attachment because it's to do with something that happened to you that you didn't want to happen to you. It was an unpleasant experience. And mm. so therefore the idea of somebody, what you might feel might be poking around with that it is a little bit unusual. Um, mm. And what's really nice is particularly in like the first treatment is that you see the shoulders drop down and the breathing calm down because it is incredibly gentle, um, the work that we do. And mm. it doesn't need, you don't need to hurt a person in order for their body to respond. And actually, if you think about when is our body uh, recovering when is our body doing the best to rejuvenate itself mm. it's predominantly when we're sleeping and relaxed so therefore if you're in a state of feeling nervous or feeling very panicked or having a pain response yeah you're unlikely for your body to be in the best position for it to be replenishing cells in a better way and that's what we're trying to do we're trying to put the client in a position where they feel relaxed and comfortable they're not in any discomfort and we will consider it's a very individual what positioning we put that person in because they've got to be comfy there's no point saying to them right you've got to sit up and have your arm at this angle or you know lie on your side if that's no good for that person so everything about the treatment is looking at that individual and responding to them in very subtle ways to adapt everything that you're doing to get them to be engaged in in a positive way and to let you in to let to let, let you in that's... go to let you do the healing so so whether you know and that, that's what's happening in clinic and then when i sort of go and do the training and things i'm also then trying to um take that similar principle of well why don't you just slightly decision mm. processes that may become a bit you know if we're doing a job for a long time we all start to do it we can become automatic and that fire off it could be that they really don't like the numbness a lot of people are very numb around their scars and so they might want me to keep a hand somewhere where they can feel it because they don't like it if they can tell i'm touching them but they can't feel it so it's all these little tools that we've got where we can address that need but we need to have understood that it's there um mm. and it's definitely worth uh, and and it's very interesting this thing with with numbness and sensation because you might say to a client now I'm, I'm going a little bit deeper now is how does that feel oh that's completely fine yes I don't need going that deep and then you can move to an area where you know they've got full sensation and say well just to let you know this is the pressure that I'm putting on there 
because I've had clients who've gone away and they might have been feeling a bit, um, you know, stiff or achy, and then they've put a hot water bottle to an area where they've been scarred and ended up with, uh, with quite bad burns because they didn't realise it was numb and they've, you know, rested or gone to sleep or, um, you know, uh, so it, it's important for them to realise that they need to be a bit more cautious. So what's the best compliment you've had from a patient? I'm sure you've had many, but I'm sure there's probably one or two. That's one that really stands with me is a, is a lady that I treated at the hospice and um, she'd come for, she'd come for that. She'd been able to access free therapy there and she was quite quiet and I wasn't really sure how much she, 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 I knew she'd physically got, uh, we'd got improvements but I wasn't sure how she'd found the whole experience mm. um, and as, as I was walking her back to the waiting area she said I'm going to remember you for my whole life I'll never forget oh. this and it was oh. um, it was particularly touching because I hadn't been sure yeah. you know the rapport had been there in the same way and and yeah I'll never forget that it was it was so sweet um, and in a positive way you know she, yeah. she felt that I'd made a difference so. oh, that's lovely. that was very nice that's lovely but you just want to go oh. yeah i know i hate lockdown i want to get back i miss i miss, I miss hearing nice things from people oh i know it's hard isn't it all this time is hard but thinking back to all your years of even non scar work stuff any amusing experiences that you can um sort of report back to us Oh, allowed to. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, in work related. Yeah, work. Let's I think probably work. I'm a lot. I I I have to be more uh, careful these days. I know that um, my, but certainly I. It's a more quirky area that I work in now. So I think yeah. probably recent years have been more funny. So I have been caught by my husband um saying to me in the pub will you stop looking at that man's legs but he just obviously had quite a horrific accident and i was absolutely fascinated with his scars so i i i, I said i try not to look but can you see those scars i'd love to come and work on them um and in fact i had to swap seats with him because i was finding it too distracting <laughs> terrible it's terrible i'm a scar ogler i'm i'm looking at them thinking oh i'd love to go and work on that well yeah. i'll tell you, you you're not alone, <laughs> alone. i'll tell you it's, it's very it's hard not to look once you you've sort of had you know a lot of success and a lot of uh, handling there what, what i'm do sure you have? walk around thinking oh my god i'd love to get onto that person's yeah, hair you know Oh, what do your parents think of your job? I mean, how have you described your job to your parents? Because parents always have a very interesting perspective on their child's career. So what, what, how do your parents describe your job? Um, I think that it's got easier the more I've done it. I think at the beginning they weren't really sure where I was going or what, why anyone would want it. I think that's, that's the thing. I think if you've, before you start exploring into this area, and if you've not really had much surgery yourself, you tend to think scar therapy, you know, isn't that something a physio does? And you know, that it's quite narrow. And then actually you realize, well, you know, lots of people have had mm -hmm. a scar that, 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 you know, if you're a holistic therapist, you might want to think about looking at. Um, so I think they just say, oh, she's, she you knows she sort of works in recovery, but they're both quite proud of, of what Brilliant. I'm to achieve. And I think particularly, you know, I have done, so much work with different charities um i think most parents quite like the fact that they can say that oh their children have done, done a bit of good i feel like i've done a bit of good in the last few years brilliant um, which is very nice to giving to back up. something and you know that yeah sort of thing. yeah wow and right here we go really random question now emma <laughs> if you had a superpower what would it be i always wanted to fly Definitely. Mm -hmm. Why I mean, where? Well, I don't know. I just, I, I remember as a child wishing that I could, I think I couldn't be bothered to walk down the stairs thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice if you could just kind of do it in one big jump? Um, and yeah, I like that idea. I like the, I like, I like the thought of the freedom of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though I'll be able to swim underwater without any devices, because I'd love to go and do all the scuba stuff. Okay. I'm frightened of what might happen with my ears. I'm a bit of an earophobe, you know, that thought from popping. Um, yeah. 
but you know, I could just I could just try scuba and I'd be fine. But uh, <laughs> the idea of having a superpower to be able to swim under the sea without having to worry about your ears or your breathing would be quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah, so we're, we're soon to see Emma Holly flying down the street. To and diving in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with a double wall. Oh, brilliant. And um, during lockdown, during these very strange times, have you started up any interesting hobbies or anything like that? How have you managed? I've been a bit sporadic, if I'm honest. I did, I did yoga for about the first four weeks, and I like yoga, but then I found it quite hard to kind of keep the momentum up. I like my routine. Um, so I, in terms of new hobbies, I haven't really introduced anything. Done a bit more cycling than I would normally, but I think it's, but when I go out on my bike, I think half of Hertfordshire is doing more cycling as well because it seems to be hundreds of us. I know. Um, but yeah, but I think, I think it's been a really tough time and um, I've got you know, kids who are, who are teenagers and I think it's no fun when you're a teenager. You don't want to be stuck in the house with your parents. So I, I'm quite a lot of it negotiating you know keeping everyone happy and keeping enthusiasms mm. up and you know dealing with all those things oh well I, I think we've I think we've all done so well just to sort of uh, 10 weeks isn't it it was the 10th mm -hmm. and last clap of, of um clapping the carers wasn't it uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. so quite momentous uh, occasion there so what's your top tip for a healthy and happy, well, I don't know whether you can call it happy, but healthy and happy lockdown, what, what's something that you would say to everybody to do? I mean, you know, just as a whole, just. I think, you know, just pick up the phone to somebody maybe, or, you know, do a Zoom thing. I definitely found when I've reached out and communicated with other people, it makes you feel more normal. Mm -hmm. And I think you realise that actually we're all going to be all right. And I think mm -hmm. the whole it's the ice you know it is the isolation part of it we are generally speaking used to being out and having lots of human interaction and even just all the screens when you go into a shop or anything um kind of cuts away that so maybe reach out to somebody yeah good top tip i like it <laughs> <laughs> have you got any top um other top tips you'd like to share with us or any any top tips for you know self-care top tips for self-care is I would say the biggest thing that I wish everyone would hear and I think they don't hear enough of is if you can you know get on and start massaging your scar it's much more important to be more gentle um they tends to be a little bit of quite old-fashioned advice out there to say come in and start rubbing your scar really hard but um actually a little bit it's tends to you don't want to cause any more inflammation so if you start pushing around with it and you probably can't realize how hard you're going and you make it irritated potentially you could have a more a negative impact on your scar tissue whereas if you do start massaging it but you just keep your pressure really light just do some nice little circles around the area or just some little strokes towards it that's really really good to keep things because it gets a bit cloggy and things kind of sort of stagnate in a way um, if you just keep things moving um, then i would say that's a good thing to do Gosh, fantastic thank you very very much for the top tips and some insight into the life of emma holly <laughs> <laughs> You're very well. thanks for organizing it